Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. From his room above the Kunar River, looking over the quiet little town of Balakot and the Nansok Valley, the portly jihadists reflected on the torments God chose to inflict on his faithful. The light of the sun and the water are essential for crops, otherwise they go to waste, Masood Azhar Alvi later wrote. In the same way, the life of nations depends upon martyrs. The national fields can be irrigated only with the blood of the best hearts and minds. The road to freedom is paved with human bodies. Let out of prison on New Year's Eve in 1999, in return for the lives of the hostages on an Indian Airlines jet hijacked to Kandahar, Azhar had emerged as a star of the global jihadist movement. Following the hijacking, his new organization, the jaish e Mohammed, attacked India's military headquarters in Srinagar, bombed Jammu and Kashmir's Legislative Assembly, and stormed Parliament House in New Delhi. Finally, on the cusp of what he considered an historic triumph in Kashmir, Azhar was marched by fate to prison again. Manacled to a bedstead, clothes drenched in blood, he would remember, this time on the orders of Pakistan's military ruler, General Parvez Musharraf. Azhar then retreated to Balakot to nurse his wounds and his ego. 25 years after the hijacking, India is locked in a tragicomic debate on whether the producers of a Netflix series should have mentioned the Hindu pseudonyms the hijackers identified themselves by to their victims. The inchoate rage though hides painful national wounds. Like in so many other cases, the series reminds us that a powerless India has been yet unable to punish those who committed violence against the country. Like Azhar himself though, India ought really be contemplating how it ended up winning the war in Kashmir, even if there was no surround sound, technicolor climax to the Indian victory. In 1831, Azhar's ideological hero, the charismatic cleric Sayyid Ahmad Barelvi, led an ill-fated rebellion against the Emperor Ranjit Singh. The cleric hoped to eradicate syncretic influences from Islam and restore it to what he considered to be its pure state. The rebels were, however, betrayed by local Pashtun tribes loyal to Ranjit Singh and slaughtered. Across the river from Sayyid Ahmad's austere grave in Balakot, thousands gather at the Bhai Balaka Baithak, a shrine even today revered by Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims, which celebrates the syncretic culture he hoped to dismantle. Like other parts of his aging ambassador car, the fuel gauge wasn't always reliable. The engine died, starved of fuel less than a kilometer after the car made its way onto the highway in Srinagar. Early in the morning of 11 February 1994, Azhar's second day in Kashmir, he'd been driving back from a meeting at the village of Matigund. Forced to take an auto rickshaw, Azhar and his old jihadist comrade Sajjad Khan ended up being detained by the border security force when the assault rifle armed duo attempted to scrounge petrol uh, from a pump. Azhar's mission to Kashmir had been meant to persuade the cadre of the Harkatul Mujahideen and the Harkatul Jihad al-Islami to merge into the new Harkatul Ansar. It had begun pretty badly. Even the men, more likely than not, had little idea how profound the consequences would eventually be. The son of Allah Baksh Sabir Alvi, a retired schoolmaster and poultry farm owner, 1968-born Azhar was the fourth of five brothers and sisters. Azhar initially studied at the local government school in Bahawalpur. However, sources close to the family say that financial pressures led to his being sent to the Jamia Ulum Islamia Seminary in Karachi after the eighth grade. He graduated from this seminary in 1989 as an alim, a qualification given to those who have memorized the entire Quran. Led by the cleric Nizamuddin Shamzai, the seminary had become a 
पावर हाउस ऑफ द ग्लोबल जिहादिस मूवमेंट अंडर द बिनाइन गेज ऑफ जनरल मोहम्मद जिया उल हक्स मिलिट्री रेजीम द स्कॉलर फरजान जाहिद नोट्स द सेमिनरी ड्रू स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड Shamzai was a close ally and friend to both Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda and the Taliban chief Muhammad Umar. Azhar ended up joining the Harkatul Mujahideen which was then led by the jihadist commander Fazlur Rahman Khalil. Even though the somewhat overweight Azhar failed to complete the 40 day Harkatul Mujahideen combat course, his talents were soon recognized. The British journalist in his bowen has recorded that Azhar made a highly successful fundraising and recruiting trip to the United Kingdom in 1992 addressing gatherings at mosques in Birmingham, Nottingham, Leicester and Sheffield. Azhar was also assigned missions to fundraise in Bangladesh, Kenya, Saudi Arabia and even Zambia. Likely Azhar developed this close connection to Al-Qaeda sometime during this period. Shamzai and Osama bin Laden Farhan Zahid reports had very close personal connections which were forged in the course of the jihad in Afghanistan in 1998 following attacks on the United States diplomatic missions in Tanzania and Kenya Shamzai issued a decree proclaiming that I quote if Sheikh Osama is captured or harmed jihad will become obligatory against all governments involved this was a pretty direct state threat to the Pakistani state itself Azhar the counter terrorism expert Don Rassler points out served in Somalia in 1993 alongside top al qaeda commanders who were assisting somali jihadists according to the pakistani scholar mohammad amir rana bin laden and azhar also held two personal meetings during this period one in kenya and the other in saudi arabia central intelligence agency documents that we reported on this week in the print reveal that the harkatul ansar received direct financial assistance from the inter services intelligence directorate of between 30000 and 60000 dollars a month the harkat however also benefited financially from its links with bin laden and his affluent arab networks kalimullah khan the chancellor of the jamia farooqi seminary and mufti rafi usman the chancellor of jamia islamia center for jurisprudence were put in charge of resolving a toxic series of schisms which erupted over how these funds were to be shared and allocated azhar was dispatched to kashmir to enforce their decision to merge all the factions into the new harkatul ansar azhar arrived in new delhi early in 1994 traveling on a stolen portuguese passport following visits to the graves of various prominent religious and islamist political intellectuals in lucknow and deoband as well as meetings with injured jihadists who were being treated at private hospitals in new delhi azhar then flew to srinagar the cleric's accidental arrest at that petrol pump led to an unprecedented campaign to secure his release four british tourists were kidnapped from delhi's pahadganj neighborhood in 1994 by a jihadist with deep isi links ahmed omar said sheikh to risk him house ago and david mckay were then kidnapped from a shrinagar houseboat in 1995 five more western nationals were kidnapped that same year and then tragically executed even the cia learned from sources with the harkatul ansar that it was preparing to target an indian passenger aircraft as we revealed in the print but neither new delhi nor the west were really prepared for the coming disaster likely azhar's close ties to bin laden drove the extraordinary effort to have him released there is no other case in which similar efforts were made for other incarcerated jihadists bin laden had wanted azhar freed bin laden's own bodyguard nasir al bahri has claimed and ordered al qaeda to plan the indian airlines hijacking with the harkat This Al Bahari claimed was because Bin Laden admired Azhar and needed his help. Following the release in Kandahar, Bin Laden is reputed to have thrown a feast for Azhar at the Tarna camp. Taliban officials would privately claim that they for their part cooperated with Al Qaeda during the Kandahar hijacking because of India's ongoing military support for their rivals the Northern Alliance from 1996. Akhtar Mansoor who succeeded Muhammad Umar as the Taliban's chief is believed to have personally supplied the explosives and assault rifles 
used by the hijackers. Akhtar Mansoor, according to Indian officials, also ordered heavy weapons to be deployed to prevent any possible Indian rescue effort in Kandahar. Flailing in the hours after the hijacking in Kathmandu, former Punjab Director General of Police KPS Gill has pointed out, the government of India repeatedly lost opportunities to avoid the embarrassment in Kandahar. The chance to terminate the hijacking in Amritsar itself, when the hijackers did not yet possess any firearms or explosives, was squandered because of poor decision-making, Gill noted. Little serious investigation into the exact contours of the events in Kandahar was ever conducted either. The United States did not grant India permission to extradite the Taliban government's then foreign minister, Vakil Ahmad Mutawakil, who it had captured after 9-11. The official translator who negotiated between Indian officials and the Taliban, Rehmatullah Hashimi, now lives in Oslo. He's never been questioned about what happened and why. Few details have ever emerged on the hijackers themselves either. Zahur Mistri, who's alleged to have stabbed to death passenger Rupin Katyal in Amritsar, is reputed to have been killed in a shooting in Karachi two years ago. 59-year-old Ibrahim Athar Alvi, one of Azhar's brothers, is the only one of the five hijackers currently listed on Interpol's global list of fugitives. Even though Azhar emerged as a jihadist hero though, hubris was to lead to his downfall. The jesh e Muhammad he founded was tainted from the outset by its close links to Al-Qaeda. This meant the jesh e Muhammad was unable to capitalize on the deep networks of financial and material support that had facilitated its growth. The organization's ties to attacks on Western targets, including the assassination of the journalist Daniel Pearl and the 7-7 train bombings in London, further delegitimized its Kashmir operations. Finally, elements in the Jaish became hostile to General Musharraf after 9-11, earning the Pakistan army's wrath. Following 9-11, India was able to use the changed global climate to argue that the jihadist threat in Kashmir was not just a regional problem, but a threat to the world. And what happened in Kandahar was proof. Kandahar might have been a victory for Azhar, but it was also the moment of his strategic downfall. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm a contributing editor to The Print. Thank you for watching this episode of Security Code.